Hello, this is Dr. Jess Armline coming to you from Methylation Support at the Center for Bioindividualized Medicine here in southeastern Pennsylvania. Today we're going to talk about insomnia or why can't I sleep? The scourge of the 21st century. Insomnia has been thought of both as a symptom and as a sign, but essentially insomnia has several criteria. One is difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, or non-restorative sleep. This difficulty is present despite adequate opportunity and circumstance to sleep. And this impairment in sleep is associated with day daytime impairment or distress. And this sleep difficulty occurs in at least three times per week and has been a problem for at least one month. And this is from the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine in 2007. As you can see, the general prevalence of insomnia in the population uh, is between 30 and 48%. And personally, I think it's a whole lot higher than that. And I think that insomnia by itself and the things that cause insomnia are one of the main reasons that we have so much excitation and excitotoxicity in our society. The consequences of insomnia Insomnia is more prevalent in women with both the onset of menses and menopause. Various medical disorders like psychiatric disorders, working nights or rotating shifts, all represent significant risks for insomnia. It's important to recognize that these factors do not independently cause insomnia, but rather they are precipitants of insomnia in individuals predisposed to the disorder. In fact, chronic illnesses are a significant risk for insomnia. It's estimated that the majority of people with insomnia, which is like 75 to 90%, have an increased risk for these comorbid medical disorders, such as hypoxemia, dyspnea, which is difficulty breathing, uh, gastroesophageal reflux or acid reflux, uh, pain conditions, and neurodegenerative diseases. This is saying that people with insomnia are at increased risk for these other conditions, and that's an important takeaway. Other consequences of insomnia are things like restless leg syndrome, periodic limb movement disorders, sleep-related breathing disorders, and psychiatric disorders. In fact, that 40% of insomnia patients also have a coexisting psychiatric condition and depression is the most common. I often wonder which came first, the insomnia or the neuropsychiatric disorder. But um, that's a, um, something that we should, <laughs> we're going to be discussing as we go along. My sainted Nana always said, if you poop and you sleep, all will be well. And I listened to my Nana. But let's talk about the sleep portion today. And what causes insomnia? First, let's look at the sleep-wake cycle. This is rather daunting, I realize. But... Let's go through just the sleep portion, which are the thicker red lines. First off, you should know that light runs the show and that when light decreases, uh, there's, a less, there's less glutamate getting to the suprachiasmic nucleus. The pineal gland releases melatonin, which starts the sleep cycle, and 5-HT, which is serotonin, and GABA are the things that you see going along the entire part of the sleep-wake cycle. So melatonin starts the sleep-wake cycle and serotonin and GABA continue the sleep cycle. And if you have too little of each, you're going to have difficult or non-restorative sleep. So GABA is necessary as well as serotonin. But you should understand that light drives the sleep-wake cycle. So in our society today, video games, large screen TVs, computer screens, electromagnetic fields in our 24 seven world is what's affecting our circadian rhythms, raising cortisol, cortisol as well as upregulating glutamate. And this is part of the reason that we're having difficulties. You know, when I was a little boy, the only things that were open on Sunday, let's say, were the church and the bakery. And TV kind of just shut off at midnight. The um, stations would just say good night, and it was all over and done with. And there were very few 24/7 places. Now, 
it's unusual for anything not to be open 24 seven. So we're in a world right now that constantly stimulates us. And this is one of the main reasons that our sleeping is affected and the lack of sleep is what's causing a lot of disease. Uh, by the way, the only population without insomnia is the Amish because they don't use the electrical stuff that we use. Some of the root causes associated with insomnia, and that means that these kind of uh, disorders can cause sleep difficulties. This is from the Neuroscience Corporation in 2012. Histamine, cortisol, melatonin, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, glycine, GABA, glutamate, phenylethylamine. Essentially, imbalances in any of the neurotransmitters can be associated with insomnia. Possible genetic involvement. Well, you all know that uh, we're heavily into genetic polymorphisms. Okay, that's the big thing today. And our group is the uh, recognized experts around the world. So here's some of the possible genetic involvements that may be associated with insomnia. Diamine oxidase, DHNMT, which have to do with histamine metabolism, neurotransmitters, COMT, and the GAD, uh, glutamate decarboxylase, or catechol methyltransferase, which makes it difficult to break down uh, excitatory neurotransmitters. Uh, leaky gut syndrome, and you might find that with the IgAs or IgGs or IgE. Uh, SHMT or the FUT2, which also has to do with B12, but has a lot of contributions to the gut microbiome. Aldehyde metabolism, and there's more than NAT, but I was running out of room on the paper here. Uh, methylation. Mitochondrial dysfunction, which is a biggie, and let's not forget the warrior gene, monoamine oxidase. Here are some examples of what you might see on a application. This is Sterling's app, version one, uh, with someone with significant COMT and GAD involvement. The effects. The polymorphisms in these genes may cause upregulation of catecholamines via slowing their breakdown, thereby not allowing the body to relax and sleep, maybe slowing the breakdown of aldehydes and histamine, contributing to immune upregulation and dysregulation via leaky gut, prevent energy production in the mitochondria. So if your ATP pathway is interfered with, you're not going to produce energy and you're not going to heal disruption of the methylation pathway. And remember that the genes are pointers. You do not treat the polymorphisms or SNPs directly, but you can counterbalance the upregulation with phenylated GABA or other inhibitory neurotransmitter precursors while you are investigating the root cause of the insomnia. Hence, our constant exhortation, treat the person, not the SNPs. I'll say it again, treat the person, not the SNPs. One more time, treat the person, not the SNPs. This is a study that was done by the Neuroscience Corporation. It's very interesting because these four subjects all had insomnia. And on the left-hand side, you'll see epinephrine, norepinephrine, 5-HT being uh, serotonin, glycine, GABA, glutamate, phenylethylamine, histamine, cortisol, and melatonin. And it gives you what the optimal ranges for all of them on the next column. And then I want you to notice that the different subjects, although they have the same symptom, which is insomnia, okay, some of them have different issues. So subject number one has high epinephrine or norepinephrine, uh, high GABA, but probably not high enough, and high cortisol. And gee, I wonder what's keeping him or her awake. Okay, and subject number two, the GAB is quite low, but the phenylethylamine is very, very high. And that usually means that person's going to have a mind racing kind of feeling, that feeling that the eyes are slammed open and the mind is just racing. Okay, subject number three has a fairly low serotonin and fairly low melatonin. So guess what? This person probably can't get to sleep. And remember that the pathway for tryptophan is tryptophan to 5-hydroxy tryptophan to serotonin to N-acetyl serotonin to melatonin. So if you have slow, if you have low 
serotonin levels, you're going to have low melatonin levels. And of course, subject number four has high glycine and high glutamate. The high glycine is an um, indicator of immune problems in the midbrain, and the high glutamate is sort of like putting itching powder down somebody's back. How to diagnose insomnia? Well, History, 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 of course. If you listen to your patient, they'll tell you what's wrong. But what I mean by diagnosing insomnia is not diagnosing the word insomnia. It is finding the root cause for the insomnia. And that's what's vitally important because you can use a load of Band-Aids, but let's face it, if you don't get to the root cause, the insomnia will continue. So physical examination for any disease processes that may be causing the insomnia, neurotransmitter testing, hormonal, neurohormonal assessments, testing for pathogens, laboratory assess, uh, assessments for the most common imbalances like in diabetes, thyroid, hormonal, immune, chronic infections, things like Lyme, strep, yeast, parasites, assessment of the GI tract for leaky gut syndrome and dysbioses, and a review of the genetics for possible biochemical pathway anomalies or abnormalities. Otherwise, you'll get Band-Aid treatment and more serious problems can occur. Well, let's talk about Band-Aid treatment. You know, there's no dishonor in using a Band-Aid when you're bleeding. The dishonor occurs when all you do is use a Band-Aid band -aid and don't go any further. So these treatments don't fix the problem, but cover it up. So sleep medications like Ambien, Lunesta, these are sedative hypnotics that if you look at the literature, they're made for short-term use, like less than two weeks. But guess what? People have been using them like all the time. And there's loads of stories out there. There's loads of studies showing that this can only cause bigger problems. Things like benzodiazepines, uh, Valium, Ativan, Lorazepam, uh, Xanax, and so forth. These will cause dizziness, drowsiness, loss of coordination, headaches, so on and so forth. And you can read the list as well as I can. But I think I don't have to say that the long-term use of benzodiazepines uh, can have can be negative uh, for the individual involvement. And it's not getting at the reason for the insomnia. Even melatonin itself can have uh, side effects, including daytime sleepiness, dizziness, and some other less known side effects like abdominal discomfort, anxiety, irritability, confusion, short lasting feelings of depression, and melatonin supplements can interact with various medications. So if you're on a Band-Aid treatment and you have insomnia, the fact is that in the short term, it's probably not a problem. In the long term, it can really affect not only your sleep, but your daytime effectiveness and your general health. So it's worth looking for the root causes. Treatment for insomnia. Well, treatment is wholly dependent on what you find wrong, but it never hurts to follow Brother Occam's razor from the 14th century, which I'm not even going to attempt the um, Latin there, but it says when you have two competing theories that make exactly the same predictions, the simpler one is usually the better. In other words, let's go back to basics. Good sleep hygiene. Okay, and here's some suggestions. Avoid napping during the day. It can disturb the normal pattern of sleep and wakefulness. Avoid stimulants such as caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol too close to bedtime. And let's face it, when alcohol is well known to get you to sleep, uh, it disrupts sleep in the second half of the sleep cycle as the body begins to metabolize the alcohol into aldehydes. And if you have any genetic predisposition to difficulty in breaking down aldehydes, this is going to cause arousal. This is why some people may fall asleep, but then wake up and uh, are getting somewhat excited during the night. And when I say excited, I don't mean angry. I mean having excitation symptoms. Sleep hygiene. Exercise can promote good sleep. But vigorous exercise should not be done in the evening. Relaxing exercises like yoga, um, meditation, and so forth can be done before bed and to initiate a restful night's sleep. Large meals close to bedtime, uh, especially if you're making dietary changes, 
uh, it's not a good time to be experimenting with spicy dishes and remember certain things that you might like like chocolate have caffeine and phenylalanine in it which is the precursor to phenylethylamine which is what we talked about before maybe giving you a racing mind uh, ensure adequate exposure to natural light this is particularly important for older people uh, who don't venture outside as much as children and adults, but light exposure helps maintain a healthy sleep-wake cycle. Try and establish a regular relaxing bedtime routine. Try to avoid emotionally upsetting conversations and activities before trying to go to sleep. Don't dwell on or bring your problems to bed. Um, that's wholly dependent on your lifestyle, but um, if you're needing to work things out, either work them out later in the day, I'm sorry, earlier in the day, or maybe leaving certain things till the next day while you have the opportunity to let things percolate overnight and usually you can get a better um, resolution of uh, various issues if you let things go or quote unquote sleep on it. Associate your bed with sleep and sex. It's not a good idea to use your bed to watch TV, listen to the radio, read, uh, eat, and a lot of people use their bed for many, many different things. Try and associate your bed with just sleep and um, and or sexual activity, and then everything else should be done outside the bedroom. Uh, make sure that your sleep environment is pleasing and relaxing. The bed should be comfortable. The room should not be too hot or cold or too bright. Natural treatments for insomnia can include targeted amino acid therapy to reestablish neurotransmitter balance, reestablishment of cell wall integrity using phospholipids and perhaps high dose vitamin C, unless we have a high oxalate problem, of course. Essential oils for energetic balancing, things like valerian, lavender, angelica, mitochondrial support, assessment of your sleep hygiene, making your room ideal for sleep, dark, cool, quiet, comfortable sheets and a supportive mattress and pillow. And most importantly, again, is assessment, identification, and treatment of the underlying causes such as leaky gut syndrome and adrenal issues, uh, chronic infections, etc. What, what I don't have written down here uh, that I think is really important is assessment of the electromagnetic fields. Okay, there have been a lot of people who are very, very sensitive to electromagnetic fields, and not only should the charging cell phones should be away from you at least 10 feet away or <clears throat> sometimes it is important to know where the electrical centers are in your house if they're near you know the head of your bed even through a wall or above you or below you uh, the electromagnetic fields may be affecting you so what have we learned we learned that insomnia is a spectrum disorder in other words, many different causes causing a similar expression. That it's imperative to find the root cause of the insomnia and it's got to be brought to light and treated. Otherwise, you'll just be taking Band-Aid treatments and that's not a good thing. Successful treatment includes good sleep hygiene, treatment of the root causes and the downstream effects, as well as decreasing dependence on the sole use of Band-Aid treatments. And you should all know that insomnia is, in fact, curable. What do we do? At the Center for Bioindividualized Medicine, Sean Bean and myself are pioneering the bioindividualized medicine concept. So we're, what we're saying is that we're expert at discovering the root causes of insomnia. And we treat not only the root causes, but the downstream effects, as well as identify and compensate for the genetic contributions. And that is as holistic as anyone can get. And we, our toolbox includes many different uh, treatment modalities and methodologies that are utilized uh, individually with people, not in a protocol manner. So we're rather unique as very few healthcare practitioners today will take the time and effort to consider you and your condition in a genuine holistic manner and are learned in all these various areas. So that's why we're teaching and mentally and men, <laughs> not mentally, but mentoring healthcare providers in these concepts. These providers are improving the diagnosis and treatment of chronic illnesses worldwide. And frankly, we're quite proud of them because it takes quite a lot to uh, change your mental paradigm.
for those who wish. Consults are available by Skype or phone, and we are available worldwide. We have patients all over the world. Uh, my email address is bioindividualmed at gmail.com. Sean's email address is info at matrixhealthwell.com. My phone number is 610-449-9716, and Sean's is 484-868-0916, or anyone can get in touch with us by filling in the contact form at methylationsupport.com. For healthcare practitioners, we do offer practitioner support, especially if you need help in understanding the complexities of bioindividualized medicine and methylation issues. Uh, we will consult with you on a one-time or ongoing basis doing case reviews or teaching you and working with you on these various uh, complex subject matters. Uh, we also offer personalized mentorship opportunities and the contact numbers are the same as we mentioned before. Again, this is Dr. Jess Armine and I appreciate your attention today and remember that insomnia is curable.